Hello, this is Agata. And this is Raúl. And this is SciWai. Welcome to the third episode of SciWai, which I would like to start by asking, did you do chemistry, Agata, in high school? Yes, I did. And did you hate it? It's not that, that much that I hated it. It's just that I didn't understand it. And my teachers were rather terrible. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what happens with generally chemistry teachers, but they are pretty terrible. While well, chemistry itself is pretty fun. I'm fun like in a, in a kind of magical way, you know, like in Harry Potter when they were doing potions. <laughs> yeah. That's total chemistry. But then you have Snape as your teacher and you hate it. That's the problem here, exactly. you know? Well, um, I was always cheating in my high school chemistry class. So I, I was always sitting close to someone who knew chemistry and then they would write like the answers on a, on a tissue or like a small piece of paper and then pass it to me. And then I would pass it to the next people and then I would pass it to someone else, so... And then everyone failed because the answer was wrong? No, 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 usually we were passing and the teacher was like, La la la, I don't see anything, I'm blind! Lol. Yeah, it was fun. You know, sometimes teachers w say this thing like, If you cheat, you don't trick me, you are tricking yourself. And you're like, bro, if I, I, mind. If I pass and I didn't study, I'm tricking you. <laughs> uh, sorry, that's it. I mean, th there's no other way to well, put it. Well, I, I really don't mind Because I know myself. that I didn't study, you know? So, like, yeah. I, I don't trick myself. What the, I mean, you know, masturbation is tricking yourself. Mm. But cheating in an exam is not. Uh, what, what's the difference? I wouldn't say masturbation is tricking yourself. If you trick your, your brain into thinking that you're having sex, no? Mm. Not really. I, that's not how I see it. I, I see it more like a self-care ritual but that's not the topic today let's go back to chemistry <laughs> yeah we will cover the, that topic maybe other day the which point... you love chemistry because chemistry is your thing yeah yeah i graduated chemical engineering so this is my thing so i would say that i have experience in being taught chemistry mm -hmm. experience as a chemistry student and something that every chemistry student struggles with is learning the periodic system, this table of the elements, mm -hmm. okay, uh, which is something that I really, really don't understand. Well, back in the day, I thought like mm, the table of the elements, the periodic system is really important. You have to study it because my teachers told me like you have to study it because it's really important. You have to learn it by heart. And you have to like calculate things with that. Uh, well, the, yeah, but well, like, that's another it, matter. It's somewhere in my brain that like I remember learning about it and doing things with it but what for I cannot really tell well the periodic system basically organizes the elements all the known chemical elements mm -hmm. one by one mm -hmm. and it shows the most important properties that it will influence how these elements will behave later in chemical reactions mm -hmm. so let's say that the periodic system is the basics of chemistry but my problem here is that all teachers will tell you to learn it by memory, mm -hmm. to memorize the table, mm -hmm. which to me makes, makes no sense, makes zero sense. And today I'm going to tell you why your chemistry teacher was wrong in telling you that you have to learn the periodic system by memory, because you are not supposed to. That's the exact opposite of what the periodic system was supposed to be. To begin this story, uh, you have to understand how was the state of chemistry back in the day. And I'm telling you really back in the day, like 17th and century back in the day, okay? Mm -hmm. Really long time ago. I, I don't really remember those times. In those times, chemistry and physics were considered the same subject, the same science. You couldn't really split physics and chemistry as it is split nowadays. And even nowadays, we have physical chemistry, which is a branch of chemist, and you have other very complicated branches of physics that maybe we will touch them in other episodes of SciWay. But the point is that now, physics and chemistry are split. 
but back in the day they were together. So in the 17th, 18th century they were the same branch of science. Okay. And the thing is that since we are talking about really long time ago, even farther than that, it was not even talk about uh, physics and chemistry. It was considered all of it natural philosophy. No, ah, I thought that okay. like the science. It was natural philosophy since That's so weird. Since it was thought that well, you have nature, so to understand nature, all the processes that happen uh -huh. in that, therefore natural philosophy. And later, that sounds so strange. Later, uh, it became biology and natural philosophy. So biology was the first science to split from that. Okay. And then other branches of science were uh, splitting and you know dividing into the different fields that we know nowadays. So and now we have like five hundred of different fields of science. Yeah, we, we have a lot because specialization is the basics of science. But in the 17th century, chemistry was split from physics as two different fields and it had a huge boom. Everyone was super interested in chemistry and a lot of elements were being discovered, a lot of the properties of these elements were described and generally chemistry was becoming its own science independent from everything else. So like now everyone is doing podcasts, back in the 17th century everyone was a chemist. Everyone was very interested in chemistry. However, chemistry had still a long development to do. And by the time the 18th century came, the chemistry was very developed, but they were limited by their equipment. So they knew a lot of things, but they couldn't go further because they didn't have the technology to do it. So how did they know it? They did it with very primitive experiments and most of the things in chemistry were only theoretical mm -hmm. because no one could prove that this was like this or like that. For I, example, I'm definitely not a scientist because I, can, I, like, I cannot imagine inventing something that doesn't exist with the theory that you think that it might work like that. Most of the experiments were even, were even so primitive that they were done with things that you have in your kitchen. So chemists were laughed at because they were using <laughs> regular things that you would find at home. You leave the kitchen to the women. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was... They were not very respected scientists. So much so that um, the atom was not proven to be actually the, in the shape that we know nowadays until the 20th century. It's something really close. It was proven in one of the papers that Einstein wrote in 1905 that it was experiment done with water and pollen, like pollen from the plants. Chemistry basically in the 18th century was not fashionable science. Chemistry, uh, the problem that it has is that it's mostly experimental and experiments are really expensive. You need a lot of very accurate systems and techniques, you need to know a lot of things and have a lot of instruments that they are not cheap to produce and most of them were custom made. Mm -hmm. So the chemists usually would do their own uh, instruments. There wasn't really like a shop that you would go and be like... Yeah, not like nowadays. That you are like that exactly. experiment thing, please. So uh, chemistry developed into more like the business world because chemists would produce things for the industry, for miners, for business people that had an actual thing to gain from exploiting the chemical elements. Like dynamite was invented as a substitute of nitroglycerin because it makes extracting rocks from the ground, it makes it easier. Mm -hmm. So this kind of thing. So basically like if you start making money, everyone will like you. That's kinda the idea, but the problem here is that rich people were not attracted to chemistry even though chemistry was helping rich people make their money mm -hmm. through industry. Because rich people were more interested in fancy science that will not make your hands dirty and your house smelly, like physics, maths, geology. But, but isn't chemistry like flashy, like you can put one fluid into the other and suddenly it will be like boom and then it's like a lot of smoke and you're like, whoa, that, bravo. 
Yeah, that's the thing. The like I, I would think that it's more flashy than I don't know than biology. Yeah, it's flashy, but it's not fancy. So chemistry was thought to be something experimental for the industry and business to produce things, or as a flashy spectacle to entertain rich people, kind of in like in the circus spectacle, <laughs> or. You know, you have some guests at home, so then a chemist would come mm -hmm. and be like, boom, you know, with, you know, fireworks <laughs> and stuff. And everyone would be like, oh, mm -hmm. oh please bring the tea, you know. <laughs> this is how science, like, this science looked like back in the 18th century. So it was not fashionable. And since people that had money would rather dedicate their time and resources into more fancy and elegant sciences like physics or astronomy, Astronomy is much more fancy than chemistry, you cannot deny it. But it's boring. Well, yeah. Also, you have the problem that there were no chemical societies. There were no institutes of research. Like, now, back in the day, they had Geological Society or the Royal Academy that would gather a lot of scientists to discuss theories and exchange research. There was no such thing for chemistry. When the time that the chemical society was first created, already these other scientific societies were like 20, 50 years of okay. advantage. So they didn't have this background. They had to A create... A little bit behind other... Yeah, they were like the, like the little brother of this family. <laughs> no? So when you put all these things together, you see how chemistry in the 18th century was a huge mess. <laughs> no one knew shit, basically. And the shit that was known, it was very loose and the problem here is that chemists were working alone so there were no general standards in science in sorry in chemical science because uh, the advances were unknown some did know some didn't know because there were no international agreements so it happened a lot in chemistry that two different scientists one in sweden another in italy would come up with the same theory do the same experiment and come up with the same conclusions, which is something good, because then mm -hmm. the theory... It confirms. Exactly, it confirms. But they didn't know about the existence of each other. So they both were like, oh, I'm the first, yeah. and I'm the best, and I'm the only one in the whole world who came up with it. And then turns out that actually two weeks earlier, some guy in some village came up. Or so before you. they were limited because of the technology. And because there were no international societies... And there to, was no internet. Exactly. To, they couldn't exchange information. So chemists were very isolated, usually working alone. Since there were no consensus, you can see how much they didn't even agree on how many elements there were. Because uh, there was no international name for elements mm -hmm. or chemical compounds. So for one chemist... This chemical compound has this name, mm -hmm. but for another chemist, this has this other name. For example, sulfur, for a really long time, was not called sulfur. was called sugar of Saturn, because of the color. Okay. Because it's yellow, and the Saturn planet is also looks yellow. So, you see the point? Like, mm -hmm. it makes no sense, and it doesn't mean anything. Like, sugar of Saturn, what is that? Does like, it even look like sugar? Just yellow? Yeah, it's kind of with crystals, you know, okay, it has, like... kind of powdery, so could make sense, but it's not very scientific to call something sugar of Saturn, <laughs> especially because sulfur has nothing to do with sugar. Yeah. Sugar is organic, and sulfur is very much not organic. It's not even sweet, so, you know, it, it really makes no Have sense. Have you tried it, like, you know, put, like, yeah, yeah. lick the finger and then put it in A lot of chemists sauce. would come up with the properties of elements by just tasting them, <laughs> smelling them, you know? Okay. And they would be... And then they died, like, next week because of, I don't know, some poisoning or yeah. radiation and shit like that. <laughs> exactly, because they didn't know, and the only way to know back then was... Well, try. To link it. Try and see what happens, it. you know? Okay. Then you have another problem that not only they didn't know how many elements were there because they didn't agree on the name of the elements, but also the elements that they did agree, like for example, iron or copper, they were to be learned in a really long list okay. that sometimes had no specific order. 
some would put the list of elements in alphabetical order mm -hmm. because well, why not you know so <laughs> with the name of each element there would come the properties like the atomic mass the atomic number um, the i don't know mo boiling points things like that mm -hmm. so all the properties that were known and you had to learn them by heart you had to memorize them from a really long list that was not that long it was like only 50 or 60 oh, elements yeah. But still, it's pretty long when you have to learn from a list of a lot of weird names and a lot of strange numbers next to them that makes no sense. They have no no real meaning. Well, I agree that they make no sense because I have no idea how... I have no idea how elements make sense. Like, how did you just go and you were like... So this element has um, that mass. And it's like, wow, how do you know? You usually wait it. How do, isn't it like super small or something? Yeah, one day we will talk about how how small atoms are and how the atomic research was done. It was a pretty interesting story. Crazy, it's magic. But you have to understand how chemistry was such a huge mess back then in the. Oh, I trust you. I believe that. So when you understand what a mess it was, then you will see how revolutionary was the idea that had a Russian boy that invented a system so brilliant and so obvious that no one could understand how come that no one discovered it first. Okay. And it is regarded to be one of the most elegant scientific discoveries. Oh, so I like that. Let's talk about Dmitry Ivanovich Mendeleev. Aww. Which for sure the everyone boy, knows. Mendeleev. Everyone knows of the name course. because everyone that has gone through high school knows Mendeleev. And the thing is that you had to study that in high school as part of your chemistry classes. So everyone knows Mendeleev. He was born on 27th of January of 1834 and died on 20th of January of 1907 according to the Julian calendar. This is the first. <laughs> the first fun fact of Mendeleev okay. is that uh, Russia did not adopt the Gregorian calendar. Okay, now we work with the Gregorian calendar mm -hmm. that was introduced by the, pa the Pope Gregory in the year 1582, so mm -hmm. in the 16th century, to correct the mistakes that were done with the Julian calendar. Mm -hmm. Because the Julian calendar thought that the year had these many days, and actually, there were not this many days, but these other. So there was like a little difference that year by year you don't notice, but when you accumulate the years, mm -hmm. the difference can be really huge. So this uh, calendar had to be corrected. So the old Julian calendar was transformed into the Gregorian calendar to correct this difference in the calculation. By the time that these calendars were implemented, there were 13 days of difference between the two. Ooh. So there were like, like two weeks of difference. Yeah. So it's a lot. So it was something necessary. Okay. And this calendar, Gregorian, that was updated and it started in the year, as I say, 1582, substituting the Julian calendar, it was only for the Catholic countries <laughs> because the Pope, well, was the one that yeah. was like, guys, you have to do this. The problem here is that Russia is not Catholic, it's Orthodox. Yes, it's so a, then yeah. Russia said no. <laughs> back, your in the, calendar. back in the year uh, 1582, they said, your calendar makes no sense, it's weird, so whatever. And they didn't apply it. Who applied it to Russia were the Bolsheviks. <laughs> when they did the October Revolution, they wanted to erase all traces of religion. So they said, guys... We have to update the motherfucking calendar because it makes no sense. <laughs> so they implemented the calendar 336 years later. A little bit later, like um, just, you know. It happened it's then. Different. It happens then that Mendeleev was not born on 27th of January. He was actually born on 8th of February. And he didn't die on 20th of January. He died on 2nd of February. Oh, on my birthday! Olé! Yay! I was born and Mendeleev died and life goes on. 
So, he was born in a town that is so small that doesn't exist anymore, near a bigger town that it still exists, no. called Tobolsk, in western Siberia. Siberia is very far. It is really fucking far. And it's it, like middle of nowhere. It's insanely far, I will tell you later. They have bears there and it's cold. So, parents of Mendeleev were not really rich, but they had enough money. They were comfortable. Because the dad was the headmaster of the local school. Ah, so education was probably... And he had thing. studied in the St. Petersburg University. Mm. So, you know, they were educated, wealthy family. And since we are talking about the past, of course the families were huge. So huge that he had 17 siblings. <laughs> as in one seven. He had 17 because siblings. Because what would you do in Siberia except for... Constantly having sex and yeah, reproducing. With your pretty Russian wife? I hope. So? Although this Siberia, I don't know how pretty she could be. Oh well, when is that or She was bird? definitely fertile. Oh yeah. That, that's for sure. So the family had 17 children <laughs> and Mendeleev was the youngest of all. Okay. But only 14 survived. Because three died when they were born. Because Siberia in 19th century. Yeah. So uh, three died. So in the end it was only 14 only. siblings. Okay. Just 14. So Not too many. The family was doing okay. Was doing fine. Until the dad became blind. Probably because of an infection in the eyes. Oh, yeah. So he was blind and then he lost his job. Oh, yeah. However, being... I mean, when your name is Mamushka... And you live in Siberia, you have to, you know, roll up your sleeves and get to work. So <laughs> she restarted the family business, which was a glass factory. Wow. <laughs> and, you know, there she was, being, you know, boss of the factory, obviously. And they were doing pretty good. But, of course, because this is life, when Mendeleev was 13 years old, the factory burned down in a fire. Aww. And the family lost everything. Even, oh, even some people died during that fire. So the family was, again, without any means. So, you know, they had to survive through farming and stuff. The good part of having a big family is that a lot of people can come and help. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like you are totally alone. Dimitri showed that he was a brilliant student. He was really good. Better than any of his siblings. I so believe. the mom was always telling him, Search divine and scientific truth, which are words that Mendeleev would recall during all his life, and they even appear in his autobiography. How was it? Search divine and scientific truth. Okay. So, um, he was very pushed to get higher education by his mom, and he went to the local high school, and then when he was 15, his mom took him to the Moscow University, to you know, be enrolled as a in university a student, exactly, which is about 2,300 kilometers away. 2,300, okay? So they did that fucking distance that is so long, and he got rejected. <gasps> oh, yeah! He got rejected from the Moscow... I did not expect that! From the Moscow University, which is a decision that later the university regretted very oh, much. Oh, for sure, I believe that! <laughs> so, the mom not losing any of, his, any of her temper, she took him to the St. Petersburg University, which was 2,800 kilometers away from, the, from where they lived, mm -hmm. which is the distance that is from London to Istanbul. Let's say that they crossed Europe. Like I, mean, I don't think that people understand four, how... Four or five hours by flight, I think. Yeah, or something. Well, now. Now, now, now well, of, of course. course. Back then? Back then, I, I don't know. Did they even have planes? Two weeks or something? Like... It's insane. I don't think that people understand how big is Russia, but it's, it's insanely big. So they did that distance only to take him to see if he got enrolled in university. Mm -hmm. Luckily, in St. Petersburg University, he got accepted. Finally. So the whole family moved from Tobolsk to St. Petersburg. Okay, oof. By that time, the dad had already died. Aww. The siblings were, you know, splitting and getting married and starting their mm -hmm. own families. So it was not that bad. Dimitri graduated from the St. Petersburg University, but as you can see in this story, in the story of his life, is like good news, bad news. Aww. So he graduated with very good grades, but he got tuberculosis. 
<laughs> and then wow. he had to move to Crimea for the good weather to get better. And then in Crimea... Because it was the 19th century and what else could you do? In Crimea, they, uh, I mean, accepted him in the university and he graduated master studies. And he studied then the capillarity of liquids in Heidelberg. So he moved to Germany to study ah. this uh, master research. Kind of like a primitive Erasmus. Do you think he was speaking German? Do you know? Probably he was speaking German. Back in the day, people were like speaking five Well, languages. back in the day, the Russian Empire was like half Europe. Well, also a lot of people spoke, spoke Russian at that time. Probably... Yeah, so probably uh, he spoke German, French. A lot of science mm, was in yeah. French. A lot of science was also in Latin, so probably had to study Latin mm. also. So, you know, the education was like very dense. No? So when he was 27, he finished this research on capillarity of liquids and he wrote a book called Organic Chemistry. When he was 27, he wrote a book. Younger than me. Yeah. Your age. My age. Okay. And what have I done? <laughs> a podcast. <laughs> so, and that book won him the Demidov Prize of St. Petersburg Academy of Sciences, Ooh, which was congrats. a very respected uh, research institute. And that book became insanely famous. Like, every teacher wanted to have one. Okay. So, then that made him get accepted as doctor in the university to do his doctoral research, which was called On the Combinations of Water with Alcohol. <laughs> we like that topic. Fun fact, by that time, the vodka was already, by law, 40% alcohol minimum to be called vodka. <laughs> so, plenty of brands of vodka later when Mendeleev became really famous and really like internationally appreciated, plenty of brands of vodka would say vodka with 40% of alcohol as Dr. Mendeleev recommends. <laughs> <laughs> which is wow. not is not true it didn't happen and they would use these combinations of water with alcohol research that he did to say that he started the standard of 40% of vodka oh, sorry 40% of alcohol in vodka but it's not true because this standard actually started when Mendeleev was 9 years old <laughs> so it, it, I mean he didn't have anything to but, do with but it but he was a good celebrity to, to use to like advertise yeah. your vodka and this paper that he wrote was destined for medical use of combinations of water with alcohol of not for drinking 70% or more you know okay so uh, then this uh, he finished his PhD so now he was a doctor he started how teaching how old was he then? 31 oh okay he was quite quite good so, when he was 33, he had several classes, groups of students and stuff that he had to teach them chemistry, and he started writing a book for his lectures. It was really common that teachers would write their own textbooks, more common than it is nowadays, mm -hmm. because, as I say, chemistry in the past was a really huge mess. So, each teacher would rather have their own standard than learning someone else's mm -hmm. standards. So, uh, he started re reading this textbook for his lectures that was published in two volumes three years later and it became such an important textbook for students of chemistry in the whole Russia. So, the book was spread in all universities of Russia and it was like really famous, everyone was using it as the regular textbook which is something surprising because chemists usually don't like to share someone else's mm -hmm. standard, as I said. So, he must have been really good. Yeah, it was called Principles of Chemistry. So, really, the basics. really basic, and it was while writing this book that he realized how the different elements showed similar properties. Mm -hmm. He said later that the idea for the table of elements, this periodic system, came to him in a dream. <laughs> <laughs> he said that he was sleeping, and then in a dream he saw this table... So then, like, he got up from bed and had to, like, you know, in a fever, write the idea and come to it later so and he wouldn't then forget. He woke up in the morning and it was like a drawing of a horse. And he was like, what? <laughs> he, he wrote in a paper, uh, socks equal uh, feet gloves. <laughs> so uh, he came back to it and then he put it into practice in this book that he was writing. 
But the thing is, the idea that he had on classifying the elements by similar properties was not really new. Uh, John Newlands, another chemist, started this same idea realizing that elements showed similar properties when arranged according to atomic weight every eight positions. So when he would take certain elements mm -hmm. that had similar uh, atomic weight, mm -hmm. they would show the same properties in groups of eight. Okay. So then he called it the law of octaves, comparing it to how the scales are arranged in the piano. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so Interesting comparison. He, he had this idea, and another chemist then had the exact same idea, but as I said, they didn't know each other. <laughs> His name was Lothar Meyer, and he proposed a similar idea, arranging the elements by valence. Valence, as you know, is, as I know for sure. is the number of electrons that an atom must give or take to complete their last energy level. Meaning that atoms would take or give electrons uh -huh. to become more stable. Okay? And I that will, is called I, valence. I will, I will not pretend that I understand, so we can just well, continue. So, these ideas didn't really work. It didn't work because they work for some elements, but not for all of them. Mm -hmm. So the rule either works for all or for none. But to work for some, so like no one could understand why it worked for few elements, mm -hmm. but not for all of them. So they were laughed at. Aww. When they presented their ideas, everyone was like, lo, 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 your idea makes no sense, uh, what are you doing here? We were still using yeah. the alphabetic order. Huh? Everything thought, everyone thought that it was ridiculous to propose such a thing, so no one paid attention. And how many elements were there, more or less? About 60. Okay. That's so, a lot. Mendeleev... How many do we have now? 120. Oh, matko. <laughs> hey, now we have a lot. <laughs> and we have more, but they are not really stable and they exist for like a fraction of a second. So some chemists are like, this element doesn't really exist because it's not stable. Mm. Okay. So... Fine for me. The thing here is that Dimitri saw a way to combine the two ideas, and he noticed how, when you combine that uh, classifying elements by atomic weight and by valence, they do show similar properties with seven elements in each group. So not by each eight element, mm -hmm. but every seventh element. Okay. So let me explain. An atom has a certain number of protons in the core. An atom is made of Protons, neutrons, and electrons. Mm -hmm. Protons and neutrons are in the nucleus of the atom. Okay. Okay. And that is what gives an atom mass. Okay. So an atom has mass because it has protons and neutrons. I'm trying to imagine that in my head. Too. You can imagine it as like uh, this classic uh, drawing of an atom that has like a little ball mm -hmm. with few other balls orbiting around it, like the sun and the planets. Okay. Which is not very accurate, but, you know, for the sake of imagining it, it can... Okay, okay, okay. It, it can be. So... And they're like with plus and minus? Mm -hmm. like? So, protons and neutrons are together in the core of the atom, and that is what gives the atom mass. Okay. Now, the number of protons is called atomic number. Okay. Okay. So, Dimitri started to put atoms by this atomic weight in the sequence starting with the smallest which is hydrogen that has only one proton then helium that has two protons mm -hmm. and then like that in a sequence from smaller to bigger until he finished with uranium that has 92 okay okay and then he saw how these elements showed their characteristics and behavior like in a puzzle like pieces oh, of a puzzle we like puzzles so, the thing is that only by the mere fact of putting them in a line, like in a sequence, he would see how then they would garden themselves in columns. So, imagine that you have a piece of paper, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you are putting elements one after the other, mm -hmm. boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. And then when you reach the end of the paper, you have to put another row. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then... So you have like rows and so columns. You have, well, yeah, exactly. You have one row on top of the other, and then automatically they get also organized in columns. Okay. Right? Yeah, yeah. So he realized that when putting these elements into seven rows, automatically the columns 
would organize the elements by the similar properties. Okay. Okay. So then he called the rows periods and the columns groups. Mm -hmm. So each row, I'm telling you there are seven rows, mm -hmm. will start with, for example, take this first row. The first row in the first position has hydrogen. And the next element is helium, mm -hmm. which is number one and number two, mm -hmm. respectively. No? So they saw how by putting them in these rows, the columns will show the similar properties automatically, without having to do anything else. And let me tell you, he did all this shit without doing any experiment. Only sitting on his desk, he didn't step on the laboratory once. There was no need. And it was a huge discovery, but also it was a very elegant solution to put all elements in order. Instead of having to learn a huge, boring list of elements, you had them all organized in a very simple table, divided in seven rows and then the respective columns, and that's it. So, do we still have seven rows? We still have seven rows. Okay. So it was, and it has remained kinda the same as it was back in the day for 200 years, mm. adding new elements that were being discovered. But his idea was just like that, you know? It was insane because these seven simple rows were enough to organize all the elements. It was a very primitive table because now we have 120 elements, but it kind of worked with the little elements that they had back then. I'm telling about 60, 58, 63, something mm -hmm. like that, okay? So he could put all these elements into order because this table, when you read the rows, you will know the atomic number, one, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. And when you read them in columns, you will see that this group, this column, has the same properties. For example, the column of metals or the column of noble gases ah, and stuff like that. That's okay? interesting. It is interesting. And it just like goes by itself. It goes by itself. It's automatic, you know? It's like as if they were waiting for someone to put them into order. I'm telling like a piece of a puzzle that they look chaotic when you have them all together. But then you organize them and then you see the full picture, no? Yeah, that sounds like weirdly simple, but also like super complicated. And like, how is it even possible? Like if there is so many of them that they would go so perfectly in their spot. So perfect, so harmonic. Mm. It's amazing. As I never thought about that. I was always thinking like, Oh, how boring! This is so useless. <laughs> it's like it's like the table was already done and then waiting for you to put this piece in place. Maybe God invented it and he was just waiting. Lol. Maybe. <laughs> Though, uh -huh. uh, Mendeleev was born and raised in an orthodox family, but later he told his mom that he didn't believe in God. And his mom was like, oh no! She was a little heartbroken, but he was like, no, mother. I have only to science matters. follow my own path. So yeah, for him only science mattered. But the thing of this table is that not only he put order to it, he corrected the elements that were wrong. <laughs> so when he realized... Without going to, to the lab. Without touching the lab once. Okay. It was amazing. So he realized that, guys, this works. Uh, this fucking works. I can only imagine how excited he must have been when he realized... Well. Maybe he was not that excited because he was, you know, like a tough Russian. <laughs> so maybe he was like, hmm, hmm. interesting. And then that's it, you know, having your... With his your huge beard. Oh, yeah. He was more famous for his huge beard than for his, you know, intellectual capacities. And I think he had, like, long, messy hair. He was well known for cutting his... trimming his beard only once a year in a spring. So like you. Yeah. Like me, exactly like me. <laughs> now we know where your looks come from. Ah. Well, I mean, one of the most respected scientists ever, no? But the thing is that he not only put order to the elements that were there, also corrected the ones that already existed, that no one realized that a mistake had been done. For example, uranium, it was thought to have balance 3, balance number of 3, mm -hmm. an atomic weight of 120. Okay. But when he put uranium in his table, it didn't fit. It didn't fit in the position that was supposed to fit. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he thought not that his table was wrong, 
<laughs> he thought that the measurements of uranium were wrong, which is something that's bold. <laughs> yeah, it, it's something pretty arrogant to do. But I I could not be wrong. Me never. No way. So for sure you fucked it up. He thought the rule works, so it must be that the uranium is wrong. It's I mean, mistaken. Great that he he was right, but so he corrected it again without touching the laboratory, without doing any single experiment. He corrected oh the God. uranium, thinking that he had to have balance instead of three, six, mm -hmm. and atomic weight of two hundred forty instead of one hundred twenty. So, like, double. Yeah, exactly double. Nowadays, we know that the actual atomic weight is not 240, it's 238. Oh, wow, what a so difference. It is really fucking accurate for not doing one single experiment. <laughs> he also predicted the existence of well, three I, elements. I, I must say that I'm quite satisfied that he wasn't, like, perfect. No, no, because you know? he was also, you know, limited by his technology, no? Well, still. But he also predicted the existence of elements that had to exist but were not discovered yet. For example, he predicted an element with atomic weight that had to be between 123 and 126, but always under 128. Mm -hmm. That element was discovered a couple of years later and turned out to be tellurium with an atomic weight of 126.7. And he said that impossible 128 must have been around 126. It is insane. It's like... It's so It's hard insane. to believe. Like, it kind of feels like... I don't want to say that it was told to him really in the dream. It's as if someone really told him how it should be. And then he just it's like, did it. It's like God... Because how do you know it's that It's like there God be whispered this? him like, this is wrong. And then he was like, ah... I cannot really hear you, but I think you said this, and then it was proven to be right. His accuracy was insane, insane for not doing one single experiment. He predicted another two elements that turned out to be gallium and germanium that had exactly the properties that he said that they would have. And this table presented also other properties that there was no way that he knew that they existed back in the day. Mm -hmm. So when putting order in these elements by rows and columns, there were some, like, empty spots. There were empty spots that he said, oh, here it's impossible that this element jumps to this other element. Mm -hmm. There must be one or two elements in the middle that has to have these and these properties. Do we still have empty spaces now? We don't have any empty okay. spaces, but the empty spaces that he left in his table were later filled mm -hmm. with other discoveries. So the oh, table cool. remained untouched for 100 years. Or something? He left just the space blanks and being like, guys, here there must be some elements that I don't know because whatever. So <laughs> you, figure you it do out. it, you know? <laughs> like when your teacher tells you, fill in the gaps in this homework, you know? <laughs> when ordering his elements, we realized that the table showed more properties than actually he knew that existed. So the table, untouched, already was ordering properties that he didn't experiment with and that no one thought that they could exist. A very good example is the atomic radius. Let's imagine that the atom is like a ball, like a tennis ball. Okay. Okay. I can when, do that. When you flatten a ball, mm -hmm. it becomes a circle, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And the circle has a diameter. Mm -hmm. and this diameter you can measure, right? Like yes. you measure the diameter of a circle. So when you imagine that the atoms are kind of like a circle, you can also me measure the diameter. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So this is, something, <laughs> this is something that can be easily done, well, easily, more or less easily nowadays. But back in the 19th century, no one could do it. <laughs> okay? So uh, they measure now the radius of an atom, which is the distance from the center, where the protons are, mm -hmm. from the core, to the most external electron. And that is the radius. Okay. Like the radius of a circle. Yeah. So, when the scientists were researching all these radius, and different atoms have different radius, they went to the table to write down, and then when writing down all the radius of the elements, they saw that the table was already organized like that. <laughs> okay? And so they didn't have to... They didn't have to touch it. Uh, nothing at all. Like re 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 rearrange. Yeah, rearrange. They didn't have to touch it. Nothing. The table was already put in order, and the atomic radius in the table grows 
downwards and to the left. Okay. 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 For sure, wherever Mendeleev is now, whether you believe in heaven or in like floating energy or uh, reincarnation, for sure he's like. Oh, I knew it. <laughs> yeah. And this, of course, made him internationally famous <laughs> when he presented his table to the Russian Chemical Society in a lecture titled The Dependence Between the Properties of the Atomic Weights of the Elements. And then he presented the table and there was a huge silence and then everyone was like... <laughs> you know? Slow clap. A slow clap. <laughs> <laughs> and then he was like, guys, guys, okay. I mean, hold your horses, no? Like, don't start sucking dicks already. No? <laughs> so, uh, this made him internationally famous. He won several awards, like the Copley Medal and the Davy Medal. And he was made foreign member of the British Royal Society. Ooh. Which was like, it's still like very important award. Sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, these are the good news. And now we go to the bad news. Again. When he was 42, he, he was married to some woman, I don't know. And, but he became obsessed with another lady called Anna Ivanova Popova. So much that he told her that I would kill myself if you don't marry me. This but he like, was already married. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, he, this was the 19th century, so people were like very dramatic. Yeah. So uh, she eventually, of course, married him because if you tell me I will kill myself, I will be like, oh, okay, I will marry you only to not have to listen to you. No? <laughs> so... He was still orthodox because you could not resign, no? Mm -hmm. Like you don't, you don't break your, I don't know, orthodox carnet. So <laughs> uh, he was still orthodox, and the orthodox church admits divorce, but you have to wait seven years to remarry oh, after your divorce. Okay. But he didn't consider himself orthodox, so he didn't marry through the church. So he divorced, and then he married this other lady. Mm -hmm. He didn't wait the seven years that the church says that you have to. So, for the church, he was considered a bigamy. Mm -hmm. That was considered bigamy. So, it was also like a huge scandal. Okay? Oof. Like, everyone thought, like, this man has two women. Trauma. Like, lo, lo, lo. No? Insane. So... Which is so ridiculous. Yeah, well, but here we are. This was a huge scandal and made him notorious. So, when he applied to be a member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, he was rejected oh. because of this scandal. And because of this scandal, he also had a horrible fight with the management of the university. It was such a huge fight that he resigned. He was also famous for having, you know, like a strong character. So you, I mean, he, <laughs> he wouldn't take like shit. This. Yeah, he wouldn't take shit from anyone. He was like, I wanted to remarry, so, so I you. remarried. You know? So he, he just resigned from university and that was it. However, he was so ahead of his times. Years later, he was appointed director of the Bureau of Weights and Measures. What? The Bureau of Weights and Measures. Every country has a Bureau of Weights and Measures. Good to know. Yeah, it's like a... Usually, it's a very boring office that will take care of it standards. Sounds like it. Because, you know, you need standards, like how much is one meter? A meter is a chunk like this, no? Uh -huh. But, okay, so... Like, for how... sure, all the people listening now, they're like, oh, thank you, that was for showing us how much is one meter. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this space between my hands, no? And that is managed by the Bureau of Weights and Measures. So he was the director of the Russian Bureau, mm -hmm. which he used all his power and influence to bring rigor and good standards to science, especially to chemistry. For example, he was the fella that introduced the international system of measurement to Russia. Because back in the day, Russia had their own imperial system, and he was the one who started the metric system in Russia. Okay. Like okay. They were like, we have our own alphabet, we don't give a fuck about I mean, the measurements. Once you have your own alphabet, you can pretty much have your own everything. No? Well, at least we don't measure things with feet. Lol. Lol. Makes no sense. So, this was the position that he occupied until he died. At least he was... You know, like doing something. So, yeah, I mean... Not being hated by the society forever. After the bad news of resigning, then he had the good news of being director of the Bureau of Measurements. It's an important position. And then you have more good news, because in the year 1905, he was made a member of the Swedish Academy of Sciences, and the Nobel Committee recommended the Swedish Academy mm -hmm. to give him a Nobel Prize. For his, for his periodic system. And he was like, ole! And everyone was very happy. That is great. Now the bad news is that 
Another member of the Academy, called Peter Clason, proposed his friend, Henry Moisan. I don't know if this is the correct pronunciation, but for the sake of it, let's say that it is. And everyone was like, oof, now we have two candidates, what do we do? And, you know, the thing was in dispute. And then it came another scientist called Arrhenius. Every student of chemistry knows Arrhenius, he was a very important chemist and physicist. And he had received the Nobel Prize three years before. And Arrhenius didn't like Mendeleev because Mendeleev had criticized Arrhenius' theory of acids and bases. <laughs> he was like, dude, this, your theory makes no fucking sense and this is stupid and you are stupid. And then he was you know? like, I will remember it. And then he re one thing that scientists are is super petty. They are so petty. They are very childish. You always hear about stuff that they're like, mm, there is you so were much, mean to me. So now much I'm drama. To ruin your life. You think that, oh, there is drama between you two? Bitch. Scientists have huge drama, okay? So eventually it turns out that Arrhenius were right and Mendeleev was wrong. He was mistaken in his critics. But this was enough for Arrhenius to hate Mendeleev. Mm -hmm. So when Mendeleev was proposed to get a Nobel Prize, Arrhenius saw the opportunity to fuck him good and he pushed to not give him a Nobel, give him the Nobel to this other Henry Moisan that mm -hmm. was proposed. Mm -hmm. Moisan, of course, I mean, the dispute was won with the difference of one vote only. <laughs> one fucking vote, I... you know? So, of course, Moisan won the Nobel for his method of isolating fluorine. Now, I'm telling you, who the fuck knows who is Moisan? Well, not me. Well, however... But I know Mendeleev. Mendeleev is studying in high school and the periodic system is something that everyone knows. So, you tell me who actually won at the end. Mm -hmm. Mendeleev died in the next year, when he was 72. From a broken heart. From flu. <laughs> he got a flu and he, he died. <laughs> I'm sorry that I'm laughing. I know flu can be a big problem. <laughs> so he got a flu and then he died. Probably he died because he was like, I'm sick of you all, so goodbye. You know? To be dramatic, it's like, oh, you didn't give me the Nobel Prize? I will just go and die. Well, he told his wife that he would kill himself if she didn't marry him, so he will give me the Nobel Prize or I die. They don't give it, he dies, like a boss, mm -hmm. to teach you a lesson, yeah. you know? So, but apart from this, he was, I mean, worldwide known because of his periodic system, but he did a lot of other things, you know, a lot of research, and he started the foundations of what is now chemistry. For example, as I said, uh, he introduced the metric system, and he in was... In Russia. He, yeah, in Russia. Mm -hmm. And he was the first one to say that burning petroleum for heat was stupid, was the most ridiculous thing that you can do when petroleum has so many other uses that you can do. And he compared burning petroleum with turning on your kitchen stove with bank bills. Because you, you have money. With money, yeah. He compared the two. Okay. Because he said that petroleum is so good and so expensive, why would you burn it, you know? Mm -hmm. And that was the, like, the, the sparkle that lit what now is the petrochemical industry. <laughs> he was the one who said, guys, petroleum has so many applications. This is, this for sure one day will become its own branch of science. And it became petrochemistry, which is very important branch of science, as we all know also. Okay. And this was the insane life and exploits the of Dmitry Mendeleev. And then ups and uh, then downs. A story and... full of good news, bad news. Yeah. And that's the thing. He designed his periodic system so you don't have to learn the elements, so you don't have to memorize them. So you, you can just... have a poster in your room mm -hmm. and in your classroom. You can and... just go, check, open the book, read and be like, uh, how many protons were, I don't know, in tantalium? And then you go, check. You and Google it. it and that's it. Nowadays you Google it, but you back in the day just open the book. You have your stupid teacher covering the poster with the periodic system on the wall with like blank paper being like oh it's to make sure that you're not cheating dude that was made to be there and it was made to be used cheating yeah i mean not really cheating but no. so that's Ugh, that's why guy, all I chemistry have... teachers are shitting on him because you're not supposed to learn it you're not supposed to memorize it you're supposed to use it so, Follow the advice of the creator. Yeah. He knew why he did it. Exactly. Probably he was like, oh, fuck it. I will have to like memorize it alphabetically. Oh, 
And that is all for today, I'm afraid. Oof, that was a lot, a lot of like science, science. But I'm glad that there was some drama from the <laughs> Mendeleev that made yeah. me like, ooh, spicy. So yeah, and this has been all for this week. And in the meantime, you can follow us on Instagram at sci.y.podcast. And we hope to see you all again next week. Jenki pa! Jenki pa!